the properties are the same in all directions. That's not true. Drops are anisotropic. <coughs> and usually, we get to see that because of the position with time, and because of the fabric of rocks, how it forms due to gravity, you tend to see that rocks are stiffer in the horizontal direction. If I were to take a sample of this rock and another sample here, this is horizontal, it will be vertical with respect to bedding, uh, you will tend to see that the horizontal rocks tend to be stiffer than vertical <coughs> rocks. So the Yam modulus of in horizontal direction tends to be higher than the Yam modulus in vertical direction. Sometimes uh, some rocks are more anisotropic than others, and some others are closer to isotropy, but there is no such thing as an isotropic rock. And we will see later on that also this anisotropy is not only on elastical properties, but also on failure properties, which also is very important uh, to take into account. So that, that's the first thing. Rocks are anisotropic. Remember that. Uh, probably when you were running also your test in the lab last week, you saw bedding planes, and sometimes the rock will fade preferentially along those bedding planes. That's part of the anisotropy of the rocks. Uh, second. Uh, rocks are not linear elastic. We like to use linear elasticity. It's easy to use, but rocks are not linear elastic. Uh, usually, we also, together with elastic strains, uh, we have elastic strains. And what that means is that the elastic part is recoverable the formation, the plastic part, is irrecoverable deformation. So let's see an example of this. This is what happens when you were loading samples in the lab, and you saw that sometimes you will do start loading, and then unload. It doesn't go through the same path, and then you reload again, and picks up where it was before, and you get to a point where the, this one, this curve starts to, to bend, and then it breaks. Of course, after it breaks, if you were trying to release the stress, you will come back somewhere over here, all of this is irrecoverable strain. Even this, this small unloading, also it doesn't go through the same path. Already here you will have plastic strains because you do not come back to, let me zoom up a little bit. You do not come back to this point, otherwise it will be elastic, you come back to that point. You never recover that strain. That one is also irrecoverable strain. And usually, in these processes, um, let me see where I have a little bit of space. I mean, leave the arrow. <coughs> in this region, you will measure your loading modules, and in this region over here you will measure your unloading modules. And a phenomenon associated with plastic strains, since they are not recoverable, is that your unloading modules is always going to be larger than your loading modules. Only the when you do the unloading, you have uh, all recoverable strains. That's a truly elastic process. But during the loading, most times you're going to have uh, plastic strains. And, and you could say, well, wh why is this important? Well, it is important <coughs> because also in the, 
in the field, in well-worn conditions, sometimes you have elastic strains. Some other times you have plastic strains. And when you're drilling and you cut the rock and you get to failure, like going through this peak, those strains are going to be uh, <coughs> irrecoverable. When you have uh, failure around the wellbore, uh, breakouts, um, that's also going to be uh, irrecoverable strain. Whenever you have these irrecoverable strains, using only elasticity, uh, it's not going to give you the, the best answer for your problem. So, um, our, on Wednesday and Friday, we're gonna talk about how rocks fail and how we can predict this maximum point, okay? So I'm not gonna talk too much about this plasticity right now. Uh, I'd like just to finish up with one more point, which is called viscoelasticity. And this is also very important, and it recognizes the fact that the loading time affects also the properties of the rock. It is not the same. Let's come back again to the typical compression experiment that you have done in the laboratory. Could you move the paper? Yes. It is not the same to load the rock in the laboratory <coughs> very quickly in a few minutes, as you have done it in the lab, maximum, I don't know, what was your longest experiment? 10 minutes, maybe? 20? Uh, 10, probably no more than 10, right? Probably five minutes. Well, it is not the same to load a rock in five minutes than to load it <coughs> in, in the field over the terms of, of a few years, or to have it load, loaded <coughs> on the terms of millions of years, of thousands of, of years in geological time scales. Usually rocks are going to tend to be softer and to deform more for uh, in long periods of time compared to short period of time. So, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, guys, but some of the experiments that you do in the lab, I'm, I don't want to say they are irrelevant, but they are not quite what it happens in the field. In the field, let's say this one is in the term of one minute. In the field, you could have uh, the reservoir compacting in the term of one year which is quite different to what happens over here. And in geological time scale, probably you have that in the terms of a million <coughs> years. So it, it is not the same. It is quite different. Uh, and it's going to happen the same with the maximum load that rocks can take. Sometimes you can put a rock uh, to a, a given load in the lab, and it's not going to fail. Uh, but over a long time, uh, it might fail or it might deform it a lot more than what it does in the laboratory. So, uh, just to summarize uh, this type of viscoelasticity, there are three forms in which we see viscoelasticity uh, phenomena. One, so this number one over here, is <coughs> related to strain rate. And in general, E fast is going to be always higher than E slow. The general. <coughs> there are some other two types of phenomena related to viscoelasticity. <coughs> to fix, fit everything in one page. Uh, the same uh, phenomenon also causes what is caused, the strain what is caused when you load the rock at the constant stress 
and you keep the stress constant. So, and this is a function of time. Let run this experiment in your head. What do you think is going to happen with strain? I load it, and probably it's going to deform. Okay, so we agree with that. But my point is, what's going to happen after that? I stop loading, but I keep the load, but now at the constant value. Is it going to continue to deform, or is it just going to stay flat as stress does? And now we're talking about a real rock. Uh, I can't hear. It's going to continue deforming, and that deformation is called creep. So once I get to that point, it will continue deforming, and then it will tend to reach an asymptotic value over time. And this is what is called a creep strain. Some type of uh, rocks, like for example, unconsolidated sands, or sands, or salt rocks, tend to have a lot of creep. If, even, you know, in salt rocks, the creep may be so high that you may be drilling a well bore, and if you don't case it, uh, if, if you take too long to case it, the hole may close on you because the rock is just going to deform and just close the well bore. So that's why in these type of rocks, uh, you have to uh, case them uh, very quickly. Let's do now the opposite test to this. <coughs> we're going to get a rock and we're going to now subject it to a given strain. Like as we do in this type of load frames. Uh, we strain it and then we keep that strain constant. Uh, as we apply a load over here, you also may expect that the stress is going to increase. But now again, What's going to happen after that time? Will the load stay the same? Will, will, will it go up, go down? What do you think? Why will it go down? So you say go down, right? So so can you tell me why? Any reason for? Because uh, you're you're changing the structure of the material itself. Now it supports after you strained it, it now supports in a different way. Well, there are several explanations for this type of uh, viscoelastic phenomena. One of those, as you said, once you load it, everything is under stress. And for example, if you have uh, sand grains, they may start to s slowly move relative to each other. And that's going to be also a irrecoverable strain. Sometimes, if you have stress on a rock, you have plenty <coughs> cracks that will start to propagate with time. And also, that will result in the rock to, after you get to that peak, to decrease its load. It's not going to be able to keep that, that same load. And this is something which is called stress relaxation. And uh, this is next. And, uh, and that is also important <coughs> in the field because sometimes we, we might have uh, a period in the during time that we have tectonic plates that push in one direction, but then they stop. Then they stop, and the stresses do not stay with the same value, but they relax over time. And then we'll probably have stress in other directions, and uh, those stresses are going to gradually get lower with time. So, um, I have a little bit more of, of these written in the notes. Uh, 
But th this is very important that, that you guys that you remember. We're going to come back to, to this as we see some applications. Uh, but I wanted to make a summary now uh, for you uh, to remember that real rocks are not linear, are not isotropic, <coughs> and they are not elastic. And it is important to, to acknowledge that, that and also it's important to know that in order to in interpret correctly uh, your data. I'll bring um, sam unconsolidated sand samples uh, next on Wednesday, and we'll see some of these uh, a little bit better than uh, what we'll do today. So today we have 15 minutes uh, to talk about, start talking about failure of rocks. My objective is to finish the topic of failure of rocks by Wednesday uh, next week, so it can go into the example, okay? So, so far, we have seen all properties of rock uh, without breaking them, although you broke some of those in the lab. <coughs> now we're gonna start to uh, understand how rocks fail. And I can anticipate to you that there are gonna be three ways in which the rocks are going to fail. And the first one is going to be a tensile failure. All right, so I'm pretty sure that you know about tensile failure. And from tensile failure, we measure what is called a tensile strength. What do you do? How do you measure tensile strength? Basically, probably what you learned in uh, your, uh, what's the name of the class? Materials, solids. Uh, you, you perform a tensile test, right? In which, for example, <coughs> if you had a bar of, uh, of some metal alloy, and you subject that to tensile stresses, uh, eventually you can measure, let me put here, this is going to be strain, this is going to be stress. Uh, 